So today I have with me a couple of uh, film professionals who have a wealth of experience in independent European feature film production, but also experience working within a large corporation, which I think is quite a unique perspective. There are a lot of stakeholders involved in this collaborative filmmaking process, but they all have different agendas, and from a producer's standpoint, perhaps not always in uh, lockstep, maybe conflicting from time to time. If you've tuned into this for the first time, the purpose of this broadcast is to bring entertainment professionals together in an informal setting to discuss the marketplace and find new and improved and innovative ways to, to make better product. So today, I want to talk a little bit about independent feature film uh, development, finance, distribution, to sort of see how the market is faring in Europe and what can be done to make things better. And before we start, it'd be nice to sort of get a uh, feeling for who's in the room. I have Jane Wright and Paul Grindy here. And I'd love to ask you what you're currently doing and some of what you've been doing the last 10 years, if I start with Jane. Okay. Um, currently, I have a company of my own um, with a partner called Counterpoint Partnership. And what we are is less of a production company on its own, although we could produce from start to finish film and television projects. But what we aim to do is work with established producers um, to fill in any gaps that they might have, either in terms of experience or knowledge or capacity, whatever it might be. So with one radio production company who happened upon a feature film script, we're helping them develop that script and get it launched for production. For another company, we're helping them launch uh, their television division with a possibly six-part series. And with another young producer, we're executive producing and helping him um, grow his, his movie business, movie and television business. Those are examples. So you're, you're like a mentor and a seed stage investor in that you're, hel you're taking some equity in the projects but helping them build it into something bigger and better. That's what we aim to do, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And before that, you were at BBC Film. Before mm -hmm. that, I was at BBC Films for about 15 years, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I ended there as managing director, uh, worked uh, across the piece. And it was a really interesting time because I started in 19... 98 when there wasn't as much happening in British film and certainly BBC had only really dipped its toe in and didn't have the kind of profile it wasn't attracting uh, the kind of filmmaking talent that it attracts today so it was a, a process of not just building BBC films but I think alongside film 4 which Paul can talk about more helping to build the the British industry was, was BBC Worldwide uh, f part of the company at that time? BBC Worldwide has come in and out of film. Uh, in 1985, I worked for, for BBC Films, but mm -hmm. as part of BBC Worldwide. Uh, at that time, Worldwide was making investments in <coughs> film. So, mm -hmm. for example, during my brief time there, I invested for, on behalf of Worldwide in um, Stephen Freer's The Van. Mm -hmm is one example I can remember. BBC Worldwide's real start in film at the time was about they had invested in television rights for single dramas that then eventually got turned into feature films. So for example, Persuasion. The license fee covered most of the production costs and then there was a small amount of BBC Worldwide investment. So when BBC Worldwide started to invest in feature films properly, they were hoping to get the same level of returns that one might get when you have a worldwide hit and an initial very tiny investment. And films just couldn't live up to that, and they pulled out. But latterly, they, Worldwide has come back into film through its natural uh, history unit mostly, and uh, it may do more in the future. Mm. And Paul, you've been with Film Four most recently. Yes, yes, I left uh, only a few months ago. I mean, if you, if 
as what I'm doing now, um, probably best to ask me in a couple of months' time, actually, because I'm working out, working out what to do next. I think it's quite an interesting time to be looking at new ventures in media and digital right now. But going back to the sort of Channel 4 years, uh, I've spent over nine years there. I, I joined originally Film 4 Limited, which was the min- virtually integrated sort of mini studio run by Paul Webster. So I was there for the shutdown of that. And, um, and then in early 2003, uh, I was one of just three employees to survive, if you like, into the new film for, and then Tessa Ross came on board as head of film, and we had a, a pretty good run in terms of building film for, the brand Film 4 back up again and, and investing in some good films. By the time I left Channel 4, I was looking after business affairs for film, drama and comedy, scripted, generally scripted fictional content, and the roles and mixture of sort of legal business affairs, but also, especially on the film side, a lot of commercial and film ecology and strategy work. I mean, it was something I was very aware of and took very, very seriously as part of my job to sort of always be aware of what would be the right strategy to help the industry as a whole and where, you know, where we could invest or take stances that would improve, address market failure and improve the prospects of independent producers and, in fact, the independent film industry in the UK. I think, you know, that's one of the common denominators of both the BBC Film and Film 4 is that they, they highlighted the fact that they worked with uh, new talent and really nurturing young directors and, mm. and producers and were very instrumental in, the, in helping the British film industry survive. And perhaps it's worth just touching upon the fact that they're part of broadcasters because this seems throughout Europe to be very important to film finance. How integrated are the film and broadcasting sides of these businesses? Well, <laughs> it's a good it's a good question. To some degree, not at all. Um, and on another level, it's very important to remember who your paymaster is. So, one of the the comments that's often made is that broadcasters in the UK working in film are are much more in touch with their audiences than, for example, the BFI or the former UKFC. But the truth is, when you work in a film division within a broadcaster, you're serving two audiences. The first one is the cinema audience, because the films that perform best on television are the ones that perform well in the cinema. So that's the audience you primarily have to cater for, while at the same time keeping a close eye on what the channel wants to play out and use its its own brand on later down the road. It's very helpful for many quality films to get money from a broadcaster because these might not be the most commercial films in the world, but they tend to be talent attracting, they tend to win awards. There's a perception of them being very high quality, and I think uh, that's important. There needs to be a mixed ecology in a broadcast environment to do, yes, some new talent work, but also to make sure that you're working with the best producers, the best talent there is to keep the quality very high. I think financially, too, it seems an important pillar. When I looked at, we were chatting before we started recording about the DCMS uh, review, and the chart that looked at uh, box office or gross revenues of film in the UK pretty much showed a third, third, third breakdown between cinema was a third, um, DVD sales was a third, and then there was terrestrial broadcast was a third. So it looks like there's a lot of money in the broadcast side, roughly 1.2 billion pounds, it said, of revenue. So um, having the broadcaster aligned with the, f- with the cinema or the film side seems like it makes sense in these marketplaces. Do we have enough screens in the UK to really support UK film in a, in a big way? Um. Well, we do have enough screens. I mean, we have we have, the UK is a pretty heavily screened territory. But generally, uh, if you're releasing a film independently, you're generally fighting for about ten percent of those screens. The rest of them are kind of locked down by the studios, and that is one of the sort of big issues um, around the, the sustainability or viability of an independent film business. Is is the fact that actually access to screens, unless you have truly have a breakthrough title, is very hard. Um, I remember at Channel Four. I have a colleague, Harry Dixon, who put it really, really well. He basically sort of said that a film like Avatar deserves to dominate and be on every screen around the world. You know, those are kind of, those are huge events. But when, you, when you're seeing, you know, screens being taken for a mediocre Adam Sandler comedy, 
well, actually, maybe our own media uh, media comedy should, <laughs> could you have a yeah. have a shot at that 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 sort of marketplace. And with independent films actually generally fight to get the proper exposure theatrically. And not only do they generally have access to only ten percent of screens. The terms in which they get that access are much worse. The film rentals payable to, for independent distributors are generally lower than those payable to the studios. It's a function of the bargaining power of these, these large studios and their negotiations with the exhibitors. And we and the independent distributors often don't have the scale, usually don't have the scale, to really market independent film the way the studios do. There are a couple of exceptions, and in fact I can even think of last year Entertainment, which has done did a fantastic job with the Inbetweeners movie for Channel Four, where Entertainment really believed in the film. They only had theatric rights, uh, but they they deservedly made a lot of money out of it. And they they are they have been I've noticed over the years been very they've been particularly good at marketing British films with a kind of in a sort of with a blockbuster mentality. But they're also very selective as a type of films they, they do that with. It tends to be British comedies that they think have a zing to them. And, I, and, and obviously they did very well with the Lord of the Rings franchise. But uh, you know, that is just one distributor that has the scale to, to, to make those kind of moves. There are some others, uh, Pathé is an example um, of a distributor which has some marketing power. And I think the Iron Lady is quite a good example of that. But we'll come, maybe we'll come to that it's bit so later on. It's so fascinating, too. The Iron Lady seems like a quintessentially British film, and Pathé is an important part of it. Well, it was, it, it was, in, it was originally developed by the BBC. It was an independent, independently developed and financed <laughs> film. And I think there's, I think what's quite interesting in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of sort of brand Britain films that have that have come out and they've done really really mm. well. I mean, you know, looking at Margaret Thatcher, looking at the Queen, looking at you know, her father. Mm. Um, these are all. It's a measure. It's it's a measure of self confidence that the, 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 the industry has to start telling these stories. They realise there is some there is some interest around the world. And first and foremost, though, they they have to be good stories in their own right. Whether we'll ever get to a more modern sort of brand Britain mm. remains to be seen. I remember uh, back to the sort of mid to late 90s, there was quite a new wave of sort of young British films, you know, young British filmmakers making films that had a, had a kind of, you know, modern British edge, and they, most of them didn't work. Now, that, that was down to the, probably whether the films worked on, on their own editorial cultural merits or not, but whether wh- wh- what's left after we've kind of done the obvious low-hanging fruit from sort of the brand Britain subject matter, mm. I'm not quite sure. Uh, hopefully there will be stories, and I, there are huge opportunities if you are prepared to be bold with your subject matter, but I mean, at the moment, the Hollywood the distributors have locked up 90% of the screens. The the advent of multi-screen, large multi-screen multiplexes has simply meant the same film being shown at shorter intervals rather than more screens available for unusual fare. I think that the... Is this uh, likely to be changed at all by digital distribution or is it going to be the same? No, I don't. I think uh, that leaving aside the economics of digital distribution, the studios simply have a, a very large... Mm. Bargaining power. I think there are ways for there's other there's other forms of exhibition. I'd quite like to see, for example, a sort of film circuit, a film festival circuit, uh, playing at at the, at, uh, at the major summer festivals. You know, make make more of that. Make make film festivals weekend immersive mm. experiences. Don't necessarily the independent films go in one by one to compete against the very large Hollywood blockbusters on a weekly basis. I mean, there, there are other ways of looking at this. Um, and trying to find a way through. Um, but I think it's I think it's it is important to think about um, cinema exhibition exhibition. I think because I'm primarily intrigued by you know new technologies and new media and other ways to reach audiences. It's easy to overlook uh, the cinema, which you know is a wonderful place to see a film. But in the in the UK from that from the DCMS review, I thought it was fascinating that in, on average. Uh, a British person will see 80 films a year, only three of which are in the cinema, and yet the cinema is generating a third of mm. the receipts for, for film product in the UK. So even though it is only three times a year going to the cinema, the revenues that are getting back are significant, and it's at 20% occupancy. So it's an inter- there's, a, there's, a, there's a big margin, it would seem, and, having, and to being able to dominate that theater circuit sounds like it's crucial. Mm. Do you think um, an increase in venues, uh, small house, maybe mixed-use venues, would help the independent film sector? 
Yes, I do. I mean, a, a, a big part of that preponderance of revenue coming through the, the the exhibitors is is the fact that they have they have a certain they have a certain sort of bandwidth, which is like a physical bandwidth. They're in city centres. Kids like to go out. They like to meet their friends. It's one of the it's one of the places where generally you can meet. You can choose what you want to do. You can have a you know you can have a drink or you can mm. you know have a coke or whatever. There is a bandwidth that is very very valuable. And I think for an alternative audience for independent films, yes, I think that there is there is scope for small independent cinemas to sort of grow and and, and and foster more of that sort of, not necessarily art house mentality, but sort of independent film discovery mentality. I mean, I, I remember when I first when I first started working in London, this is a long time ago, I was a corporate lawyer in the city. I lived in Clapham, there wasn't an cin- independent cinema there, in fact there wasn't anything for miles around apart from the Brixton and Ritzy. I quite seriously looked at setting up independent cinema because I used to run my university cinema mm. with a friend and but in the end, the property prices simply were too high. You'd always be outbid by a developer look at you who wants mm-hmm. to, you know, wants to build uh, apartments. But as part of larger scale retail developments, independent cinemas can be very, very, you know, attractive places. Almost more so than than a conventional multiplex. I think that there that there are opportunities for uh, the right uh, distributors or exhibitors to to, to work with developers to make take more of these spaces. And I well, there could be interesting business opportunities there, because I think of how uh, bookstores started opening cafes, and that sort of changed the mix and the use and the, and the, and the returns that they had. Yeah. And I think that, you know, cinemas could be more than just a place to go see a film, and that, you know, there's a, the Whiteleys has recently opened up one of those sort of, um, I think of it in terms of gold class, because in Singapore, there were, for many years, they had this gold class cinema where you'd go and you'd have this lazy boy style seat and they'd serve you mm-hmm. dinner in courses and there was a full bar and tap type of thing and you paid three or four times the usual uh, amount, which wasn't unreasonable for what you were getting. And so now I think they're experimenting at Whiteley's here. But some, and, and there've always been, I guess, um, other you know, smaller cinemas where they offered you know, more food F&B opportunities. But it seems like maybe there's further room to grow in that direction. It could be a place where people gather to have a shared experience. Mm. And there's some kind of, you, know, you might be inviting friends so that's a group that's going out and other things that can take place in those mixed use environments. So there's probably some more innovation there. I think, I think it's really important. I mean, my dream would be to have little um, community centers. Um, and it may be that we need town halls and uh, you know, municipalities to take much, be much more proactive and take some responsibility for this. I live in Ealing, where the local cinema has been shut now for a number of years. All that exists is the facade, and there have been arguments back and forth about uh, its redevelopment. And there are promises now that it will it will happen. But in the meantime, what's happened is little uh, cinema clubs have formed in a variety of little communities. Pitsanger Village has one, Acton has one, Ealing has one. Because it's really important for people to gather together and watch films. I should also say that art house as a term in North America, or the U.S. in particular, is much more about independent film mm. than it is pure art house. I think I was told once by my boss at BBC when I worked there, never use the term art house. Never <laughs> use it. <laughs> yeah, I know it has mixed dirty, connotations, It's a it? dirty word. <laughs> um, uh, but I haven't been completely trained out of it. And just to go back to that, uh, I discovered only recently that, well, I've always known because I used to work in, in the States in film, and there are a lot of independent cinemas around the country the people that own and operate them tend to be really passionate and they you know we often complain about how producers here don't make much money well cinema owners of these independent cinemas are on the bread line Mm -hmm. many times just scraping together but they so passionately believe in what they do and there's now for the last four years i think has been a gathering of the cinema owners together in something called the Art House Convergence. And there's um, on the internet somewhere, uh, you can find you know, some recordings of speakers and so on. And just the, the delight that people have about being able to gather together and talk about their experience and best practice and ideas that they've used to capture audience and so on. It's fantastic. I think that would be really useful to have. So you're, you're talking about the, the cinema as like a community center. Absolutely. A, a 
few years ago, Dieter Koslick had a program at the Berlin Film Festival looking at the architecture of cinema, and he had Lord Rogers and other great architects come and talk about developments that they were involved in. And I think those are all great, and they're, they're grand, they're the, the bandwidth you were talking about, Paul, but I think what's also needed in the environment is these little small gatherings. Years ago, I met a couple of people from Mexico who wanted to start something called living room cinema, which I thought was, you know, kind of quite a cool idea, a place where people could, you know, a small cinema. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that many people, I mean, myself included, can remember being a university student and there'd be a small local cinema that would have sofas for chairs or something and and repertory style, art house style, you know, changing every day roster of films. And it was a place of discovery and you hung out there with friends and it was a great experience. And and it sounds like there's a lot of room for exhibitors to grow because I, hearing this, I recall a conversation where someone said to me that in the last 20 or 30 years, the most single most important innovation in multiplexes was the beverage cup holder because this is like suddenly, <laughs> you know, exploded sales and whatnot. And and I realize now, you know, talking about this, that you go to the cinema and you spend just as much, if not more, of your money on F and B. So a small portion of what you spend goes to the film, and then of that, half or less goes to distributors. So <laughs> it's it's quite an unfair environment in some ways because all this f and and other products and what are being sold in the back of these movies, but that money isn't being really remitted to the, to the artists and creators. So that's something we can save for a later discussion. But definitely, I think the point is taken that there could be more innovation there, and it could be a place to bring people together in new ways to do more than just watch a film. And I think that's an exciting idea. I mean, I, there have been there's been a few cinemas experimenting with sort of demand view. I think Leeds, I think, was a, a mm. cinema uh, that, w- that was a couple of branches of one of the big cinema chains that were doing that, and that was a strategy that was used very nicely with Paranormal Activity. Um, you, know, you signed up to the website, you you demanded a view of that, and that data could then be you know transmitted to the exhibitors, and as and would be a very powerful component of the negotiations that would ensue to get that film actually actually into a neighboring cinema. Um, the Four-Eyed Monster 2 is a project that, if that's the right title, that used that model where they would get people to petition their local cinema to have a screening mm-hmm. and a showing of it. But also I've heard of interesting models um, uh, where the, the producers, particularly of documentaries, let's say if it's of a political nature, mm-hmm. which people can rally around more easily, um, offer sort of a license, as it were, to pe- for people to exhibit the film in their homes or in a church or somewhere to collect money and remit a certain amount of that money back to the producer. And these are maybe more kind of grassroots style uh, phenomenons, but they're growing. And I suppose a political activist product is a little bit easier yes. to get that kind of response. But if that you know becomes a little more commonplace, then people may start to consider other forms of exhibition yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. co-opting the public. I mean, I was thinking too about, I think it was Harry Potter where I read that they explored, you know, day and date release of VOD at different pricing and, and the idea was that, you know, you can get your friends over to your house, you could pay a few hundred dollars or something to watch the movie on, on the day of release. And I think these are, I mean, this opens up a whole interesting question of price optimization, but also the way in which exhibition is handled and whether you can co-opt the public into being exhibitors for you. Uh, I think that's kind of interesting innovation, possibly. Yeah, definitely. Um, B-Side and um, Sally now lo- no longer exist, but they, they were a documentary distributor, and their business model was to give away a pack of marketing materials and a, a digital master of their films to anyone who wished to exhibit it theatrically, asking for no revenue share back, simply that they exhibit it at a certain time and then B-Side would make their money selling DVDs off the back of that. So it was taking the logic of the theatric window as being a promotional window to the nth degree. Which Hollywood, I suppose, did for a while until the DVD side of things uh, shrunk. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, the, 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 even amongst the sort of the big Hollywood stu- studios, economics are changing. I mean, it seems the numbers are going down year by mm. year for the traditional mm. media by, you know, between 5 and 10%. You have three, if you have three or four years of that, that's a radical change to your business model. And they're not going up in equal measure in, in new media. 
digital mm -hmm. VOD. Yeah, it seems like it isn't, isn't, isn't it holds so much promise. <laughs> when is VOD going to arrive? I saw <laughs> I saw the, the 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 stats here said 41 million pounds in 2010 from VOD sales in the UK, and you know that's better than a poke in the eye, but it's not, not much anywhere better. near <laughs> <laughs> to a few uh, you know, a few billion pounds. Um, so I guess, you know, before we kind of go on the development side of the conversation, I just thought it'd be nice if we kind of discuss an overview of what's going on in the marketplace. So from what I could find in a short time before this session, well, I think we believe film is a global medium. Uh, distribution is pretty, pretty strong worldwide. It seems to be a $32 billion marketplace, at least in 2010. Hollywood is dominant in many ways, probably because it appears to be a one-stop shop. They spend a fortune on their product, on their promotions, on their marketing distribution. There's a networking effect that takes place there with all the people and the consolidation of a few companies being close together. Um, Two-thirds of the box office, however, of Hollywood is being made outside the U.S., so that's kind of an interesting opportunity. And the average production cost appears to be $60 million, and the P&A appears to be around 40, so it seems like all in it's about 100 million mm. on average. In Europe, we have a very different situation where it's very fragmented, very protectionist. Indie producers and productions are often referred to as a cottage industry and a lifestyle business because most producers we know are living hand to mouth and have to recreate a new business every time they make a film. Broadcasters appear to be the lifeblood of the system in that they can offer valuable pre-sales and things to get films off the ground. But I don't know if they spend as much as they need to investing in this cycle, so we can talk about that. 1.2 billion pounds appears to be earned from film in this country. I don't know what the average production cost for British films are, but I suspect it's nowhere near $60 million. What do you think it might be? Well, I suppose if you take out if you the, skewy. the studio film yeah. shooting in the UK that get classed as British, um, mm. No more four. than four or five million. Yes, that's my hmm. that's my Probably feeling less than too. That actually. Yes, I think it's going down, and because of economic reasons, not because it's suddenly cheaper to make a film. Although I suppose some the digital technology helps, but I, I suppose it I suppose it's helping now. I remember in the beginning it seemed to create more cost. You know, the digital technology was finicky and difficult, and you know, mm -hmm. so it was being used. In a, I guess for the pioneers, and now it's kind of uh, trickling down and becoming more reliable and less expensive. I think that's right. I think also, uh, initially, you had filmmakers that were maybe a little unused to using it and would shoot far more on digital than they mm. would have if they'd had the discipline of and fear of using up too much 35 mm. millimeter print. Digital's free in one sense, but, it's, but it, that creates a, a greater cost in post for editing and so on. It's actually interesting to point out, too, that I've seen a shift in the process of filmmaking because of digital tools. You used to walk onto a set, and you'd see something that was beautifully lit, very atmospheric. Basically, you know, everything was sort of being created in camera. Now you kind of step onto a set, and everything's very flat lit. It doesn't look particularly dramatic. There might be a little green screen around, whatever. And so much is being pushed into post. These post uh, periods are becoming very long. But I have to say that you know some of the glamour of being on a set is gone because you know now they're basically trying to get the best possible flat neutral image that they can sweeten up in post, and so that changes the the process, the structure, the psychology of it, for better or for worse. I don't know, but mm, um, interesting. We'll have to see. I mean, there is an opportunity right now because uh, the pre-sale market has is, is is healthier now than it has been for a few years. The independent pre-sale market, international independent pre-sale market. Uh, but production costs have come right down. There's been some benefits to technology, but as we've discussed, that maybe hasn't mitigated production costs quite as much as one might have hoped. But also, talent costs have come have come way down. And if, when the studios stop giving gross points to the even the the you know the, the top the stars at the top of the A list, then actually you can get if you've got quality script as an independent producer, you can get some major marquee talent working for a genuine share of the profits, not for a huge upfront salary and not for gross or, mm. or you know aggressive adjusted gross definitions um, and there's actually a bit of opportunity right now um, for the uh, good quality independent films to get financing using traditional independent ways uh, and then 
a possibility of getting a quality film at the end of it, which then has to take its chance in the, in the distribution markets. But that's if you like the next stage. That's the next stage of the film's life. But in terms of actually making a, a quality independent film, there's uh, opportunities are there. I mean, the studios are just vacating what used to be their sort of bread and butter cinema. They've just retreated entirely into the tentpole movie logics. I mean, it's, it's ironic in the in the face of digital in the explosion of digital media and explosion of social media, the studio's response to that has actually been to retreat into an even more conservative business model, which is that they work out how much they have to spend to just buy, irrespective of all the all the all the traffic coursing around the internet, people's social discourse, what they need to spend to just buy a share of mind amongst the public. And that number for, for, for most studio films now is probably a lot more than the 40 million average p a It's probably mm. more like 150 million p a for the, for the ten poles and add another 100 to 150 production costs. It's an investment of $300 million. And so therefore, they say, we know we spend $300 million per film. We can buy enough attention that we will get enough number of screens, we'll get enough space in the video retail, we'll get enough space in the satellite television, we'll, we'll hit the output deal metrics for the satellite uh, deals around the world and, and terrestrial deals around the world. And we can make that model work, but, but it's spending more to get ultimately a greater return. But if, you, if you're saying up front, we must spend $300 million to, to sort of buy that level of commercial certainty, well then it's not surprising that it default only to already recognisable properties, be they sequels or spin-offs. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an M&M's movie coming along fairly soon where we have a little animated CGI <laughs> M&M characters. I was asking about part of the place where uh, you know, um, it's, it's, I, I would have thought Transformers was beyond the bounds of conception 10 years ago, and now it's a franchise. So, uh, But in so doing, the studios have just vacated that space of films that you can't, you may not be able to know what works up front, but if it does work, you can have a, an enormous return in terms of a sense of discovery amongst the audience. And so it, there, there's plenty of talent that's been associated with very high quality filmmaking that's not getting those gigs anymore, and is available for available to work at a realistic price. There are opportunities, but it's a question of whether you have the financiers who are also willing to to have the courage to back those sort of films as well. Well, I, I think it's kind of ironic that there's a there's a precedent, historical precedent for this, which, from my understanding, is that in the nineteen, the first two decades in the 1900s, the French and the British ruled the roost in America. They had very strong product and outperformed and outsold all the American homegrown product. Mm. But then uh, the Americans started to pioneer the sort of feature length film starting with 45, 60 minute films, because they saw some European films that performed well that were that length, because up that time the idea was you come to the cinema you'd see lots of shorts in a row. Could be newsreels, animations, whatever. And they saw that they could also raise a ticket price by performing well-known plays with performers that people knew and doing feature length projects. And what quickly seemed to happen uh, was that the Americans rapidly realized that if they started to buy the audience this way by spending much more on P&A and doing these sort of feature length things with higher production values that at a certain point uh, the spending really paid off, the margins improved mm -hmm. and so they started to squeeze out the European product because they were slower to adapt to this idea mm -hmm. and by making bigger and bigger more expensive productions, spending more on P&A ironically they found that it improved their margins. And so in a way it seems that Hollywood's been doing the same thing since the 1920s yeah. or 30s. And in a way Europe has been kind of squashed down in these like, you know, sort of small <laughs> fragmented film territory while the Americans just pay, just outspend and outperform everybody else, you know. And I think there is something to be said for buying your audience. But clearly we know that the margins could be better if somehow that model was tweaked. But um, that's, I guess, the, uh, an interesting one to debate. I wanted to start off with development because this is where it kind of all starts. And development is particularly fascinating to me because I spent a lot of time in development, as I'm sure you have over the years. And it always seems to make the most sense to start there because it's the cheapest time to make a movie. And yet it seems the least invested in. So I'm kind of wondering why this happens. First of all, how long should development take, in your, in your opinion? No, oh, should. <laughs> should being the operative word. I think everyone would like it to take much less time than it does. It 
takes as long as it takes. I mean, one of the the, the issues that you were talking about, thinking I wanted to raise, was the idea of original screenplays versus adaptations of books. Uh, and I do have a bit of a fear that the space, Paul, that you were talking that's being left behind is just so heavily predominated by pre-branded material mm. that uh, we're losing, to some degree, the original voice that we used to have, particularly in independent cinema. You know, the taxi, where it's a new taxi driver type of film that's just so new, exciting, and raw, and isn't based on a best-selling book. Mm. I'm looking forward to that. But what made me think of that also is if you've got a book adaptation uh, to put into development, that can take less time, not always, but can take less time than starting with an original idea, which can take a lot of time to hone and develop and to get into the right kind of structure and shape, make it merit being uh, produced as a, a motion picture. Mm. Well, I think, you know, I'm sure that there's some writers who are listening to this. It would be interesting to to get their feedback, but it, it's not inconceivable that a writer uh, who's competent, skilled, talented, can write a treatment and first draft and polish within three or four months, right, of, a, Abs- of, of an original work. Absolutely. And, and, and so that, that seems like a reasonable time frame, and yet it never seems to take that long. So the average development time in the UK is supposedly two to three years. So why does this, why does this happen? Well, the first thing you have to look at is, you know, what do you mean by development? And uh, it, because development can be how long is a piece of string? Where does mm-hmm. it start? Where does it stop? Because it might not even just be the screenplay, getting the screenplay finished. It, it could also be about, you know, attaching a director who has to do the polish or, you know, will have his, his or her own take on the material, that sort of thing. Honing a screenplay can take time. Even you can have two kind of equally experienced writers and the process for one might be a lot longer than the process for another. And I think that's true of novelists too. Some novelists can write quite quickly and churn them out. It's hard work no matter what. And others might take absolutely years to do a similar sized book. Not that we're measuring in pages. Do you consider packaging part of development time? If there's still some work being done during that period to maybe uh, spruce it up for to try to appeal to a particular director or talent. Oh, I think I think it it is these days. There is a packaging element to it, uh, especially for films of a certain size, even a four to five million pound budget. Um, what that means is that it's not just a producer and a writer working together. It's often the development financiers the potential production financiers who start having a voice, the director that might be sought for the particular project to match the the style, the tone, the material, and uh, the financiers' needs and expectations. It is a process that, that can take time. It shouldn't take as much time as it does, but then you... You know, even just for the basic script, one needs to hone it. It's about ideas, and it can take a long time to get them expressed in the right way, in a satisfying way that fits the, you know, broad conventions of a of a screenplay. So, irregardless of all these other people who have notes and opinions and whatnot, you're saying that the artistic process can just be a very lengthy one. That can easily take a year. <laughs> mm. Oh, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Jane. Uh, I would add, though, that I've, I think that one of the advantages the Hollywood system does have is there's, there's a sort of concept in the Hollywood system of film being set up, i.e. everyone is focused, they've got a provisional start date, they, they've got a rough idea of what they're aiming for, and everyone is focused at driving the film towards production for that, for, to that date. And the series can do that because they're in control of their financing. They can just decide at That's any true. given point to put money in to, to actually green light. You don't quite have that same sort of drive when you piece together an, an independent film. You need to create the, you need to do all, everything you can to create that sense of drive. And I remember at Film 4 there was a very start of each year, they'd look at the, the editorial team, look at the slate and they'll identify 
you know, maybe the 20 projects they would like to get made that year. And they were making all of them, but they were making more than half of them, you know, maybe as much as three quarters of them that year. And the idea was to sort of create that sort of sense of drive around, you know, Really, really pushing it out to get the, the co-finances in, get the thing, get the th mm -hmm. project package, putting extra investment where necessary, and I think that's really important. The the only other observation I'd make is that I, when I've seen development take a much shorter time, is when there's been you know well-established writing teams. I just think it's a it's a tough enough craft to to practice by oneself. Mm -hmm. I was doing it with a partner that you can, you, you, you know, especially in a high-pressure situation. That's when that kind of moral support, having a partner, can really can really help you help a writer get through that process. I think that's a very good point. And it can also be, it, it doesn't have to be writing teams. It can be, um, you know, writing, pr producing teams yeah. that work really well together, or even a director can be in there. But the part of the way that Hollywood um, keeps that mindset of getting it into production, and time is money, let's face it. Mm. So we should all be feeling that. Sense that, of urgency. That sense of urgency, <laughs> absolutely. But um, they also have writers they call closers. They're not afraid to pull on yep. new writers. Um, whereas I think here we just try to stretch the little bit of development money, you know, too far. Yes. And sometimes, you know, we should just drop things or, you know, pick up a new writer, be a bit braver about how we, well, we develop Are we, are we too precious, the idea of the auteur, do you think? Is that a problem? I, I, I don't know about that. In a sense, there's a positive element we're not completely ruthless mm. but I know from even my BBC films days where we were trying to work with um, with Hollywood to, to create some bigger movies towards the end finding a writer who's a closer who is known uh, a known mm. quantity to the studios who is known as usually a structural specialist somebody who can or it might be a another kind of specialist who once they get to a work that's already fairly well developed, they'll do the business, they'll deliver a yeah. uh, screenplay that's going to work. And there's a safety in knowing that. We do need to develop um, more screenwriters in this country. And, um, you know, we need, do need to keep building skills. We also keep need to keep building ambition for writers and directors and producers, allowing them people to think that they can work in that bigger canvas as well and really understanding what that means and what has to be delivered because what gets delivered in Hollywood is a different kind of script than often gets delivered yeah. here. Well, that, that ambition you mentioned, a really interesting point. When I see the trades reporting what's going on in Hollywood, I see a pretty healthy mix of spec scripts being purchased as well as people pitching and the studio saying, great, let's get that going. And as you said, Paul, there is this feeling of like, okay, it's a go. Everyone's focused. There's mm. resources. They make it happen. Uh, here, and I think this is probably true of other parts of Europe, I don't really see a great deal of spec script writing. It seems that people might pitch something or, or want to be put on retainer to write something. And I wonder if this is also part of the reason why it takes so long. If you if you're a spec script writer, you've got to sell something to eat, and you're going to be working uh, to, to develop some of your own projects this way. Also, you're starting to think a bit about the marketplace a bit more because you have to sell your work. That has an interesting dynamic. Do we suffer in Europe from not having a, a more vibrant spec script market, or is this not an issue? Hmm, I might say it is an issue, and and partly it's an issue because of who's doing the buying here too. I mean, you mentioned broadcasters, but um, the two broadcasters that are heavily involved in um, film development financing here, BBC and Channel 4, like to get very involved in the development process. I know less about Film 4 than BBC, but they really want to be involved from a very early stage in the script. And what that means is they don't really want to finish script. I'm not saying never, mm -hmm. but it's less desirable because you as a, an executive don't feel like you've put your stamp on it, mm -hmm. if you will. I, I mean, that, that may be an issue. That's, I mean, that, that, there's two very different ways of being a film, a creative film exec. You could be an exec that has really great creative instincts and does get involved and does improve the scripts. If you're, but if you're not good at that, but you have that working pattern, you could be an absolute disaster. Or you can be a film executive, and I've come across, when I first started in film, 
uh, I had a work for was set help set up a sort of small media practice, and one of my clients, um, uh, who's a very very big time sales agent, he financed the Jeremy Thomas films. His name was Terry Glynwood, very very clever man, very very cultured man, great taste. But he would absolutely say, you know, I'm working with Bernardo Bertolucci or David Cronenberg. These are some of the world's greatest filmmakers. I see my role as kind of facilitating what they do, and you know, and, and I'm not going to have a complex about whether I have a, you know, I'm making script notes or not. I mean, you may or may not, but I don't. He, he wouldn't have a complex about that because there's plenty of other things that you know that that need to be done to get those very ambitious, independently financed films off the ground. And he did that and was very successful at that. Um, so there's two ways of doing it, really. And of I think course. that, and I remember. Uh, at film four, Tessa Tessa Ross had a good encapsulation of this, which was a sort of sense that she felt that every film had to have a sense of authorship. Now that that authorship may drive you to make a good film or a bad film, but if you had no sense of authorship, it would always be a bad film. You only had a shot of making a good film independently. There was a real strong sense of authorship to it, and so therefore you've really got to sort of uh, nurture the talent to protect the talent and maybe and and maybe strike a dividing a balance between if there are tough conversations to be had of your writer make sure they're simply between the if you like the developing executive and that writer and if you're facing the outside world you're protecting that talent or protecting that sense of authorship and often requires that, that the film execs a real creative function is actually the very start of this process the exec simply says do I believe that this person has talent or not if I do then they're probably more talented than I in pure writing terms. I should just support them and you know offer guidance, but not become their kind of creative partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I, I, from the many many films I've been involved with, and I've, as, uh, when I've seen that dynamic at work, I think that's more successful, a better strategy than when the sort of the development executive wants to be the creative partner because they really want to do that. They should get out there and start doing it themselves. But you know, yeah, I think you have. Well, well that's true, and I, and I wasn't in any way suggesting that that broadcasters, c- the creative executives, do want no, no, to no, be no, writer, no, no, thought, writers. I, I was talking but, in the generality, not rather yes. than reference the broadcasters. I mean, I do think they want to feel like they have a stake in the process. You're yeah, saying, and that's, part uh, of, that's what I'm that's saying. That's part of the psychology of it. Is. That's that's right. So it's harder to pick up a finished spec script. Was the point yeah. I was making? Mm-hmm. If if you really want to have a stake in it, but I think what. Paul's talking about is really, really important is being a facilitator, knowing when to contribute more, when to back off and allow the process to happen. I mean, it, it's, it's a skill uh, that's, that's possibly underappreciated. But to your point, should we have a, a better spec script environment? I think if, if you're uh, a, a, one of the stronger writers, in this country, you could do it if you want to, but there's not much incentive because everybody gets paid. Everybody gets paid. It's different than in the U.S. real indie market where a lot of people have uh, traditionally had to work on spec, and you know, often work for very little money as you're developing your career mm. and so on. But even some big writers will do spec scripts in the U.S. So there, even you need to have a multiplicity of people to go to who can green light production to have for, for a, a viable spec script market to work. And there's there's just not. I mean, in the UK, apparently in the 60s, there were 30 different places you can go to, where they liked your script, they will green light it and fully finance the film. Now I don't know what the number is now. Maybe four, five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got to be very, yes, very thin. And, and he, he, even Hollywood the script at market, script market is not what it was in the days of the eighties and nineties of the Karolko script with the sort of Karolko independent financing and the Sears or, and the the Joe Esther House. You know what was the ne- what was the next Joe Esther House spec script? There'll be a bidding war almost automatically mm. for spec scripts from the top writers. I mean, I have a friend of mine who's a. Uh, a writer, a British writer, but really I've always said to him you should go to Hollywood all his films are far too big, if you'd like, for British financiers to sort of cope with. And his first first time he was kind of, you know, got a US manager and first time sent one of his scripts and basically 
on a spec basis, picked up for development by Universal instantly. Oh the script was just, just wasn't getting traction in the UK. I know, it's so sad. Instantly, yeah. the American <laughs> saw it. Uh, and I was sort of, I was very happy for him, but also a little bit sad for our industry that we don't really buy. And it was this, is, and this project of his was a real European project. It's not a, it's not mm. a US project. It's, it's something that a European company should be making. I think, I think France is quite interesting. I think the, the ratio of of products and development to you know greenlit films in France is one to three, where in the UK is maybe one to ten or one to twenty. I mean, mm-hmm. where in the UK actually, where do you define a product and development? Mm-hmm. But, uh, but maybe say one to ten out, uh, you know, for the independent industry as a whole in in, in the UK. But and is the, that is that see? I would have fought for. Um, because television has tends to have that French level ratio. Mm. If you're developing something, it's going to get made by mm. and large. And I I like the freedom of having more developments drop away. It's expensive. I mm. grant you that, but it does mean that the best projects should theoretically anyway should get through. I guess what you're saying is it's maybe too wasteful. I mean, I hate the story of your friend who had to go to to L.A. to get a script. I mean, it's just so painful he, even he to hear it. He got meetings of all the top people. And even the, even the people, the series that didn't bid for a script said, you know, we, we it's so great to see a, a, a top quality spec script hitting the market. He had mm. meetings lined up with everyone. It's not, it's now we know why there's no spec script market <laughs> here. Because this is what happens. Cause, but I think it's, what, it, what cued me for this question was that you talked about ambition. And I feel that, that ambition is important, also a certain degree of flexibility. And if a writer is writing spec scripts as well as you know doing work for hire and all, all mix of things, they are developing their skills. They are you know scratching their own sort of personal artistic itches as well as working in more flexible collaborative situations. Mm. And I think it sort of brings a kind of a mindset and a mentality that you know I, I I do things for myself and I'm also a collaborative worker and you know I can I can fit into all these different scenarios and make a good living. Mm. And how, I mean, is there any innovation that we can get here in in development and screenwriting? Because I I'm intrigued how television seems to do writing room approaches, often in the U.S., the sort of mm. writing rooms like old Hollywood did. Yeah. And in fact, you know, when I spoke, um, I, I, I had a very brief time where I was able to work with Richard Maybaum, who passed away many years ago. But he grew up in, you know, in this sort of Columbia system. And he had these wonderful stories of, you know, you're working on a script, you go into the room with the other writers, you hash stuff around, people you know, help out each other to go back, finish some things. And so it was a very collegiate, collaborative process, mm. even though your name was on it and you were the primary writer. And it seems that, that television in the U.S. is employing something, well, not exactly the same, not entirely the same, but it has some similar touch points. Is this something that, that we should maybe bring into the... Um, instead, I, I think that the spec script writing is really absent uh, here for the most part and I think you can see why and it's a shame because I think it, it, it creates, it fosters a different um, flexible and collaborative mentality as well as an appetite and an ambition yeah. to, to make a good sale and for something that you did yourself and believed in and I think that's all that's, like, that's really important to the makeup of a writer. So I think that one of the problems, I mean I, I, I'm all for writers I think writing's too hard anyway without without a degree of passion for it. And I'm, I've only come across very, very few writers who could execute at that kind of re- requisite high level as a job, if you like, if you like. And they're the ones really who are the closers and just have just, you know, been able to, you know, um, hone their skill and their craft to such an extent that they can they just turn it on. Uh, I think for most for most people, you need to have passion as well. But I think the part of the difficulty is that actually, it's. You know, if you have that passion to tell a, a story unbidden, it, you know, uh, to, to, to devise something entirely new, not necessarily work will be commissioned by someone, then you have to accept that the end product of that process is your screenplay. It's not the film, it's the screenplay. And if you, you know, and, and the conversion, if you'd like, from a screenplay written with passion to then the, the film, it, that's an entirely different process. And it can be, you know, can really mess with your head to try and bring those two things together. Um, and 
I think I think writers should always, you know, be, be, have spec script, scripts in the bottom drawer because they if they get a gig somewhere else and then and then they don't have a relationship with a director or producer, well then maybe that's the point in which that spec script comes, you know, mm. is pulled out for the bottom drawer. Mm. But it it, it is a uh, it does it messes with your head to take that idea of personal passion and pour it on t- into a screenplay and then talk about the sort of the the economics. Of the film financing and distribution mm. world, you really you've got to accept that it gets you to a certain point, and then you've got to put on a different cap or a different attitude, and and take that further, and maybe combine spec script writing with commissions. I think to do it, to do solely out of specs is going to be very very tough, and and probably mm. you know if I was advising a nephew say, uh, as a, who wants to be a writer, and he says I only want to make I only want to write spec scripts, I'd say well then you're do, crazy, you're crazy. <laughs> make, mix it mix it in with commissions and find other ways in which what you write can get onto screen in some way in a way that helps you uh, develop your craft because you see the results of what you've written how it translates and also helps you get you know not gets the industry and, and potential collaborators aware of what you can do well the other thing I was going to say about spec scripts in the drawer is because you know this is all about ideas this activity it can allow you can put them in the drawer the ideas incubate. There can yes. be a zeitgeist, a right time for a particular project. I mean, I think Woody Allen apparently has just dozens of scripts in his drawer. And, um, you know, some of them work brilliantly, others not so much so. But um, I'm, ju- I'm just wondering if, if the incubation of ideas as they're just sitting there might also be a really good thing. But the mixed economy is important. And I also want to add that some of the top script writers also will do rewrites and really enjoy the process of mm. kind of putting down the bigger project that they that is really messing up their head or that they're almost too d- deep into and don't have any objectivity on do a rewrite it helps out another project they get refreshed and then they can come back and and mm. um go back to their other project so I think filmmakers shouldn't be afraid of, of going to top writers for a little polish on, on a script. Some love it. Mm. I, I ask writers that I meet here, who, you know, what's the, some of the most important relationships? Generally, they'll say to me that it's usually directors more than producers, but I think the producer-writer relationship is definitely an important one. But when I talk to someone I know who's very uh, successful in Hollywood, their answer was unequivocally, Studio execs. That that to them was the most important relationship of all because if one of them becomes a head of a studio, you're golden. Yeah. You'll be working in, in, on big projects and you're yeah. going to have a great career. So I don't know if the, the equivalent is here, um, if that is it's less it's true. It's the opposite or here. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's in their jobs for so long. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, I mean, yeah, and there are too few. And there's as too you few. Said there's too few commissioners, and then they're in their jobs for a very, very long time. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely you're right. Hollywood's such a merry-go-round. How, I mean, is there any innovation that we can get here in in development and screenwriting? Because I, I'm intrigued how television seems to do writing room approaches, often in the U.S., the sort of mm-hmm. writing rooms like old Hollywood did. Yeah. And in fact, I had a very brief time. Where I was able to work with Richard Maybaum, who passed away many years ago, but he grew up in you know in this sort of Columbia system, and he had these wonderful stories of you know you're working on a script, you go into the room with the other writers, you hash stuff around, people you know help out each other to go back finish some things, and so it was a very collegiate, collaborative process, mm. even though your name was on it and you were the primary writer, and it seems that that television in the U.S. is employing something, well, not exactly the same, not entirely the same, but it has some similar touch points. Is this something that, that we should maybe bring into the future film screenwriting process? Would this be helpful? Is this in a way what's kind of done when multiple writers are brought in, but they're yeah. just not in the same room? I think, it's inter- I think writers, I mean, for there's a number of different elements that I think with writers room the demands of American television being for 13 or 26 episodes per series unless you're a David Kelly it's, um, it's just you know you cannot deliver that as a sort of single writer so you have to do that by necessity and that I think there's also a sort of sense that you know the American 
the American corporations are rich enough to employ rooms of writers. Mm. And simply being a fellow employee with another writer, there's a camaraderie there which will be, is absent when you're in, in competition as an independent writer with another independent writer. So we, in the UK, it's harder for us to kind of create that collegiate atmosphere simply by the sort of, you know, the employment and commercial structures that we have in the UK in the UK film business, but if there's a way, but we need to look to try and do that. And I, I think that, I think that for example, in film schools, um, it should be compulsory that you find that for your one at least one of your student films. Uh, I don't know how many they make at film schools these days, but say at least one of them, you have to co-write it, or you have to you have to you know you have to have a a a, di a very very collaborative relationship with another student to make that film. Even so, just so you understand the dynamics of that. So I admit it's not for everyone, but you may discover that actually it is for you, and you may form partnerships that will be vital in your professional life. After film school, and I, I think I think that would be that, I think that would be a, a, a something that I don't know how many film schools do that now, mm -hmm. but I think they they should all mm -hmm. do. Yeah, I I went to film school. I don't re recall actually being encouraged to to do that. Of course, you had friends you might talk to, but I think you're absolutely right, Paul. That kind of collaboration and and commu sense of community is really good. It seems to require people of equals. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's it, you know partnerships work best when there's a a relative equality mm -hmm. amongst people so if somebody becomes a hit writer they don't necessarily want to contribute to the group mm -hmm. anymore <laughs> you know there's that that kind of <laughs> element you so go then, on politics oh, th th then the group involved. start feeling mm -hmm. like oh dear we're the losers you yeah, know it's uh, so <laughs> but that but this sort of thing can be encouraged and uh should be encouraged i mean i think well, something I tried, I, I, I suggested it, and of course it was never really taken, never really taken seriously. But I still think it's quite a good idea. When I was at Channel Four, was to sort of set up a kind of do a do a deal with a nice B and B or a cliff top hotel somewhere on the south coast, and just make that and a writers retreat. Any if anyone doing development on a film for a project, any you know, film for would pay for that writer if they wanted to write from that place. Because a lot of writers do want to get away, so really mm, concentrate. Mm. Wouldn't cost very much by comparison of what you pay in writer's fees and it would be a huge cachet for any writer and also you'd, you'd start to get going that sense of a writer's room you know by yes. osmosis about really about forcing anyone together simply having you know there's three writers in the same hotel and the same B&B &B, all doing cliff top walks they might start talking in the evening I yeah. mean that sounds that sounds very romantic but I believe there's a, a true value in that. Um, it's romantic, but it's not. Ex it's you know, it's most not romantic and it can follies can be to quite expensive. This <laughs> is a cheap romantic folly. And well, I, I think, think you should damn well do it. I think also, you know, you're, you, there's a common denominator in this conversation about you know about team building, and you know, when you talked about executives who don't interfere with the process because they feel they don't necessarily have something better to add in the writing and development department. I think there, there's a recognition, there, you're saying, that they see an effective team. So why should they interfere with an effective team mm. efficacy, for mm. lack of a better word, that you know they can get on with it, and I'm just there to facilitate them. And I think that if, if people kind of come together and form teams and build effective teams, they should be maintained. They should be um, resourced and maintained because that's where more good stuff is going to come from. And I think it, that in, in Europe, often things get fragmented, including people. They kind of mm. get split up and broken up. and it, it's not necessarily good for, for, the, for the whole economy. And, and I would say that in, in the you know, on Screenwriters Workshop, we definitely saw this sort of collegiate mentality develop that helped writers in that you know, they're working on their own projects, but there'd be peer review. They come to know some people they didn't maybe know before. They start offline discussing projects with them, helping each other out. And I find you know, years later that these people have deep, rich relationships, um, that they support each other professionally and in a recent project that I was working on, you know, one of the writers kind of hit a wall and said, you know, I really I can't get my head out of this thing. Why don't we take it to the other writer uh, that started the project, you know, a couple of years ago? And I said, oh, is that okay with you? He said, yeah, yeah. I've, you know, he and I have become great friends from this <laughs> process, you know, when we were in the workshop together. And, and I had no idea they'd become close friends. He said, yeah, we, we trade projects all the time now and stuff like that. And I think he'd have a better, because he's really good structurally, I think he's going to have a better insight into how to, hmm. how to rework this. So... They collaborated on a project because that process brought them together. They were able to under, to see the the value sometimes of um, co-writing, and that, that sounds, you know that so sounds like if, uh, to help writers build those kind of relationships and also that attitude. 
Sounds and like it's a very good use of public money to sort of to really expand a, a, a good screenwriting workshop program in the UK. I, th- I, th- I think that's right, and, and uh, develop a sense of safety. I think it's a risk business, and creative ideas are very risky, and it's very it's a hard process for writers often, and th- the environment that has to be created with the right attitude is w- is one where they're safe to explore and reveal weakness and Safe to uh, explore ask for help and, and also feeling that there's that they're not being taken advantage of I think yes. one of the major stumbling blocks I have when I work with writers and in sort of free forming brainstorming and whatnot is that everyone's terribly terrified of their idea being ripped off and you know this happens sometimes no doubt you know mm. there are cases where an idea was stolen and whatnot but I think it's generally pretty rare and I think that you know most of the time if you're not sharing an idea, then it's not going to go anywhere because yeah. um, it sort of sits in your head. And it's better just to kind of get it out there. And if you are really a talented writer, you're going to have many ideas over the years and it really shouldn't be precious about any particular one of them. And it's better, in my opinion, that you get an idea out there and then find that there's someone who's eager to kind of collaborate because then heat can be put on something and it could start to coalesce around a project that actually happens rather than having an idea that you, you guard very jealously and think, I'm never going to tell anyone because as soon as it gets out, they're going to steal it from me. And because as we've talked about in the development phase, you know, it can take years to get something off the ground. So the chances are of someone ripping this thing off and suddenly coming out tomorrow with, uh, with something that was identical to what you were envisioning yeah. is very, very unlikely. Yeah. And, um, and also, if anything, if you really fear that, tell people about it. Then you have some heat on yourself to, to make it happen because you're thinking, <laughs> it's out there now. You know, <laughs> I can't ignore it. I've got to work fast. So. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> who, pays, who pays for development? Oh, boy, that's a good question. Well, um, the new BFI is still the largest development funder uh, around, mm. but there are development funds that can be found at the broadcasters, regional agencies, commercially. Um, I don't know what level of business it's doing, but Nicola Horlick uh, set up a company for development, private individuals, personal relationships. Mm -hmm. So money comes from a variety of sources. It's as long as a piece of string, so it could be a very lengthy, long, involved process. It could be a very expensive process. Is there any way to make development profitable in in and of itself? Has anyone found a way to make that happen, or is it just destined, doomed to always be a big cost that eventually gets paid off when you go to production? It's R&D. Uh, and like any R&D expenditure, yes, it is essential uh, for the industry to work, but not a profit center in its own right. The list that Jane's just uh, enumerated, that's a limited list in the UK, isn't it? Mm. Um, I mean, there's a sense that there, you know, if you go if you're to working title, for example, clearly as a, you know, as a, with their deal with Universal, they really have a very, very large development budget, but that's a large development budget going to the writers that they believe in. It's it's not necessarily, you know, the, the w- I think w- for what most writers who are still, you know, working their way into the industry, it's about looking for development funds that can be spread broadly and to give people a chance to explore mm-hmm. and to develop develop their talent. And it's unfortunately, there's there are not many options. I mean, I would almost argue that the that relatively limited amount of mostly publicly funded development money that is available to be spread broadly to help newcomers into the industry is almost better put into facilitating uh, collegiate environments like you know really good a really good writers workshop program or you know talks by some but not all of the sort of Hollywood script doctors or something like that to sort of get the juices going or maybe short in short intensive experiential sort of inspirational experiences and not necessarily you know, lots of little individual small awards because it's very hard for a writer who, um, you know, coming com- coming from a place where they don't have a sort of track record or a sort of a re- established ratio of development financier, to get an amount of money from that finance is sufficient to enable that writer to concentrate on the script full time anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost mm-hmm. it's almost better spent creating conditions where that writer will get to other writers and have a have a much more sense of the dynam- the dynamics of writing and of producing scripts and doing that and uh, repeatedly. That rather than saying, well, 
out of you might have six ideas we'll choose to back one and he has five thousand pounds it's not very much i mean you can live a while on five thousand pounds but you know it's can but not many people can and so i i think then that there needs to be a more overt publicly funded development program and i think it's a shame the film council used to have separate development fund and uh, a development fund that was separate from the production funds and I thought that was a very good thing it meant that uh, the executives there could, could just concentrate on just a, on looking around and look, giving support to writers and writer producer teams where support was needed and I think bringing them all together so that they write, the development fell into production or well, that might be the right strategy for a broadcast so definitely not right for the UK, UKFC or the BFI or that the job is not there the the fund managers at the UKFC or BFI they they're not there to be, to make their own names as you know as we like producers or exec producers they're there to feed, to sort of stimulate the industry and I think that you know it, I think development needs a special emphasis and bring them together lost you know made the made the development lost some of that special emphasis I think the broadcast is different I think where you have an end user you've got to integrate development decisions with production decisions and that's more there's more you know by and large what ha- the way they operate well it sounds too like you can buy exclusivity and just focus on the project which is nice because i think in the american model that you described you know everyone's focused writers hired they get paid they're exclusive t- on the project yeah. in most cases and off they go and here because we cannot or for whatever reason we're not resourcing we're not f- paying the writer for their exclusivity and focusing everyone's attention on the project it just takes longer the, the amount of money is are on offer is not good enough to live on so people are juggling multiple projects yeah. and jobs and it just feels like all this stuff kind of undercuts we're undercutting ourselves a little bit also because of the quality i think could suffer you know if a writer cannot afford to work exclusively on a project and you're a producer can't afford to pay them very much money yeah um you know what happens it just yeah. you know the it's very difficult to keep that thing in motion to keep the attention on it and uh, that sense of urgency and sort of a, a commitment to excellence you know people will just get distracted by life and and uh it's a, a an unfortunate scenario and also we've i think sometimes kind of rush into production because everyone's so desperate to get their money out of this thing that that's a, a common side effect. So somehow bringing in, well, I mean, your suggestion for a collegiate writer's workshop, I, I, I definitely on side with that idea, and that's an interesting uh, way, and perhaps a lower cost way, and maybe a public uh, funded way would be interesting. But I also feel like, you know, somehow money has to be set aside for development given mm. to producers and production teams to to get the writer's attention and focus and get everybody aligned. I also think the pilot's interesting for, for development. I mean, television, especially comedy, pilots are, are quite a staple now, really. You know, for some, some types of broken comedy shows, you develop by making a pilot. You don't develop by mm. submitting a, you know, comedy scripts. Uh, and I wonder if that mechanism can be expanded. Uh, we don't have, you know, I'm not talking about pilots in the way the American TV industry, you know, uses that system. They got the resources to make a hundred shows a year, of which maybe twenty might be kept on. Um, but if there's an environment where, as part of development, you 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 can workshop with actors, or you can. So it's not a trailer per se, but it's a, a pilot of some kind. It's just a little taste of what we're talking about. Yeah. A little kind of visual audio, yeah. visual. And I experience. think that that would be that's what I, you know. If you if you'd maybe in the context in light of the recent BFI report what could the government could be doing I think one of the things they could be doing uh, is is allowing funding or supporting initiatives that create that kind of you know pilot you know, workshoppy you know collegiate environment now it, it does sound very maybe it does sound a bit wishy-washy in a way but I think there is there's there's enough that you can create something where where talented people can work together and and the pilot itself or the the workshop or the outputs of that workshop may not themselves be commercial but you you definitely foster an entirely different attitude and sense of urgency and a sense of collaboration to the process and you need to do that because as the industry the, the fundamental problem we have as an independent industry is we do not have the the sort of commercial superstructure to, to create those spaces and throw talent into those spaces and they can perform. 
we have we actually the talent is out there but there it's cold out there and we're not, and we're not and we don't and we don't have the sort of the financial strength to to sort of in, in an industrial process to to create those kind of collaborative spaces but if we we have to look look for other ways of creating those spaces and it may be that it, it may be it's something that is public funding that's purely written off or there's some formula whereby if projects get picked up and there's a, a levy if you'd like that it goes back to you know, there's there's various ways you can engineer you know, uh, engineer some, some some degree of financial sustainability to this, but we've got to face up to the fact that we right now um, it is a it is a cottage industry where it's very tough out there, and as you say, people are distracted by life. We need to think of what are the shortcuts or alternatives uh, to the sort of American studio system where we can create this kind of sense of urgency and collegiate working and and the, the dynamism of of conceiving and then writing and then workshopping and then shooting and then editing and then learning from that. Um, I mean, it sounds like film school in a way, doesn't it? It sounds like but, film school. But that's very expensive. But if there's, a, is a, if there's a way where actually it's not about film school, it's where film school graduates. Well, professionals. Professionals. Yeah. Uh, who have committed, who, whose career it is to do this. I mean, when, so I, when, I, when, I first, when I first started working, I used to... Used to go. Uh, used to, I spent a lot of my time at London Filmmakers Co-op, which is mm. uh, quite a nice little example of how that could work. It, it, you know, I don't. I think it's defunct now, and it was highly experimental. If you stood up on the sort of Thursday evening open sessions, you know, screening work in progress, and you're screening narrative fiction, you get booed off stage basically. <laughs> and was, uh, if you like, it was almost too experimental. But the, it had definitely, you know, it had an energy to it, and that you can replicate that. I mean, I think that. Why isn't there really a UK Sundance? I think Elliot Grove does great things at Rain Dance, but he's not resourced in the way that the Sundance Institute is. I think there's, you know, um, but there also be a UK equivalent. What what I like about what you said is by suggesting a pilot, you're also there's an assumption there that there's going to be many things, like a certain volume of things, mm. and you expect that some that some may continue and others will wither, yeah. and that's okay. That it's a it's an environment for free form experimentation expression. And that you know, one in twenty will go forth, but everyone has, you know, something substantive to get out of it, and uh, you know, perhaps they have some some equity interest in what what moves forward if they work together collaboratively. So yeah. there is, um, you know, it sounds like a great environment to nurture talent and relationships, but also create a product that has a better chance of going, and then people feeling like they're they're part of that and uh, they're even if they're not directly involved, they're indirectly supported by what happens. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's expensive though. I mean mm. just to be a bit of a naysayer because mm. I I I like pilot cities in in the US because they at the end of the day they come out with something mm. that they can put on telly, right? Mm. And test. Um although I heard about a year ago that some of the studios are looking more to do what is done here in television, sh very short series, skip the pilot altogether because pilots tend to be so expensive and the reason they tend to be so expensive is what you're doing in a pilot is setting the tone you you have to be so you're you're indicating a level of production value that that makes it very expensive to mm. produce now i'm i'm being negative in a sense uh, in that i particularly think it's a problem for feature film but i'd like to be positive in the sense that maybe with new technologies you could get the price of that kind of collaborative experimentation pilot creation and maybe even an outlet for it um, digitally that mm -hmm. didn't exist before in a way that works but I and, and I think the UK Film Council at one point had a pilot program to allow people to create not a trailer but mm -hmm you know, a, a scene or a mood or a, you know, a previs or a, a mood reel. Something, something. But it has to be done right because as a filmmaker, when you're showing it to that exec that you n desperately need to do the next, you know, give the next tick for to get it fully financed, if that person can't see beyond the little flaws or the, you know, the imperfections and doesn't take it for what it is uh, uh, you know an experiment to yeah. try out it's it becomes a really dangerous I think process. I mm. think I think if you try if, if what you're trying to do with a kind of pilot or or a 
it is to sort of have a mini me version of the film. I think that, yes, that is very dangerous. But I don't, I don't. I wasn't necessarily thinking it had to be that. It could be something as simple as mood reels or influences or, yeah. and and but that, that does take a bit of extra cash to put together. Mm. I'm actually not much extra cash really, but. Um, it's 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 not something that's part of the process right now, mm -hmm. and it's 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 a way I think of making the development process slightly more collaborative, mm -hmm. so, and a, a number of di more maybe, maybe more inputs into the process. I, For whatever I, I, reason, we don't you know we don't have right now mm. a particularly nurturing system, or you know uh, it, it's cold out there, and we and, it, and we don't we're not really mm. creating many nurturing spaces in the UK film business. Although I meet a lot of filmmakers who say the BBC broadcasting was their, you know, where they learned their trade and made yeah. important relationships. It sounds as if maybe, you know, somebody who's somewhat insulated from the commercial realities that kind of, but has some commercial imperative of sorts is a nice quasi hybrid setup where they can create a kind of collegiate environment um, but also with some kind of commercial man you know, um, manifesto of some kind. And that seemed to occur in the 70s and 80s in the BBC quite, quite worked quite well. A absolutely. Um, Less so now. But if you look at most of the major filmmakers in Britain today have come out of the, the BBC at, at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, like a Winterbottom, Frears, Loach, you name mm. it, you know, they mm. got, they, it, it, the BBC is really fortunate in that it has so many hours of programming to produce that that's been allowed. But uh, I, I mean, I think various reports are uh, somewhat critical of that there's less opportunity for newcomers now in the BBC, I think, than there was in the past. Mm. Um, I, I think the, the, the kind of piloting workshop is a great idea, and I love to see, to figure out a way to make it work. I also take Jane's point that it's, there are some potential pitfalls with that. And this was echoed by a sales agent I was speaking to about a project because the director really wanted to shoot a sort of trailer promo of sorts because they felt that it was hard to express this thing tonally mm -hmm. on paper. And, you know, I <laughs> saw these sales agents saying, you know, who might fund this? Because it isn't going to be cheap to do this. It's going to be shooting a commercial. And, you know, we'd have to set up the movie in a way to mm -hmm. get the result we wanted. And they said, well, you know, th their fear their fear was if you did something that was too kind of, if you did too good a job, the financier is going to want that precise movie. And if you mm -hmm. deliver something that isn't what they saw in the room in the beginning, they're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And if it's too vague, well, it isn't doing its job because they still haven't seen what it is yes. you're trying to create. So... That's a fine line. <laughs> and it, it, I didn't it, quite know how to get it, there. It, it is <laughs> a fine line, but um, just in terms of establishing mood, I remember one example at BBC Films was, it, it's, it's I think in post-production now, a film called Quartet that Dustin Hoffman was going to direct a, a Ronnie Harwood script. Brilliant um, feature about uh, a, a number of older actors, singers in an, an old folks' home. And getting buyers, it was Hanway that was working with us, getting buyers to really buy into it was so difficult. And I was inspired by, I think it was a focus feature trailer I saw, but it was really a mood reel because the film, not a single uh, frame had been shot, but they created uh, a promo reel which gave a sense of the adventure of whatever film it was. So we went to Hanway, and it was BBC Films that had to finance, uh, I think, at least 50% of this mood reel, said, let's try to do the same thing. And they cut old footage from different films mm -hmm. with Maggie Smith and uh, Tom Courtney and whoever else was, and created a brilliant promo reel that just gave the mood of it, said, this is going to be fun, you know, it's going to have these great actors in it. Absolutely, <laughs> we want Maggie. In, in fact, and they did it. Mm -hmm. They surpassed my expectations, actually, mm -hmm. and created something that then did start, you know, mm -hmm. helping with the whole pre-sales process. So they're good. There are pitfalls, mm -hmm. and they're expensive. And but it but what what appeals to me is 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 seeing if there is some way to create. Um, you know, if you're if you're gonna pitch a film, obviously, you know, the the strength of the pitch is dependent upon yourself as well as the material. 
And also, you might not have the right chemistry of the person or whatever, and all sorts of things can get in the way of really someone seeing the film as you see it. They might be seeing a different film anyway, and maybe they want to make that film. But there's something, I think, advantageous about having a pitch package that has the poster, a mood reel of some kind, maybe a little taste of a scene or something, because then it really starts to kind of take shape. And if there was a way to, to, to make these quite you know, cost-effective and to do them on a regular basis, it might smooth this process over because there's so many other things that can interfere mm. with getting that pitch across. Especially and for big-budget films. Again, I was working on something that was hopefully going to be a studio film, um, pre-branded. It was an adaptation of a, uh, a TV series. And I was working with a great line producer, and we had this idea that we would, you know, take the year that kind of script was being written and pull all of the elements together, gr you know, get the designer on board, spend... You had to spend the money. That was the mm -hmm. problem. And we never mm -hmm. quite got it through, but spend the money so that you create effectively a moving train you've got the script you've got the designer you've got the director you've pulled all the elements that do you go into a studio you do a presentation and it's kind of they buy into it or they don't but you make sure it's good enough that they're going to want to it's a moving train they've got to get on there they don't have enough time to think about it before they sign on the bottom well, line well i've heard other producers say you know all you need is to create this the the semblance that a movie is in the making for the movie to be made you know <laughs> that you oh, yeah, create yeah. that it, that it's sensation that it's happening, it's a done, it's a done deal, you in or out. You know, it, and, exactly. And <laughs> it's a moving train. People want to hop on a moving train. They don't want to hop on one that's still in yeah. the station. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's an old bad to When you do, it's very satisfying. Absolutely. Yeah. We know when, when Slumdog was greenlit, deliberately of no distribution in place, precisely for that reason. So I thought if you go to the distribution markets, they'll make a five, they can allow us to make a five million pound film, but it'll be, say... We green light it without any distribution. They said, by the way, we're shooting Danny's Trap now in India, all this sort of stuff. Do you want to be <sighs> part of it or not? And you, you, you up your offers by 50% and you get gross. Oh, and, you, you know, you get... Well, that, that's actually the film would essentially not have been profitable, you know, for the finance. So you're going to read me something. What were you... Well, it's not, that, it's not that interesting, but, you know, at the BSAC conference in 2007, there was a summing up session of what had gone on before. And I remember saying that I was very optimistic about the future because there is, you know, there are ebbs and flows in how the the industry works. And specifically, I was speaking of the, the film industry. But I also mentioned how I felt the consumer is king, and I think it's digital um, uh, accessibility that's allowing for that social networking. It's it, the ability to get right to the the consumer and the consumer will have a lot more decision making power about what they want to see and I mentioned that there'd been a lot of arrogance in the past where people presumed that they knew what the consumer wanted um, but I still don't think we know enough uh, about what that is I was saying to Paul earlier but I also said on the other side of the consumer experience, rather than just knowing what they want and, and, and creating it or choosing it, if, if they can, that they don't always know what they want. It's what you were saying earlier. And that's where innovation, creativity, and premium content can grab the consumer again in an unexpected way. Well, the motto to me is probably that that old adage, I don't know what I want, but I know it when I see it. And that's probably what consumers are kind of saying, is that, you know, you show me a trailer, yep. and if it hits all the right buttons, I'm like, I want to see that. That's and if the film is. delivers on that promise, fantastic. And that's that's what it takes. But, you know, to, to kind of focus group that isn't necessarily going to work. I think your point about c consumer is king, I think is very true right now. I think that, you know, convenience seems to trump all else. You know, I often bang on the drum about anything, anytime, anywhere. This seems to be what matters most to people. Um, but I think the next step maybe as community is king, possibly. That, you know, people right now, they're enjoying the kind of authority they may have in their own celebrity and whatnot. But eventually people might sort of cluster together into groups and then want, uh, you know, to have buying power in a sense by virtue of that community. And so, you know, Facebook in a way is like the sort of 
massive global community, but there isn't much community to it. It's just a lot of people and a new technology that can kind of communicate with one another, and that's all very exciting. But I think that these things will start to kind of break into niches and, and, and community becoming a very important place for people to find the entertainment that they want, that they crave, and, they, and that can be used as a, a guiding force to shape the entertainment as well. So, you know, we'll be looking at how that develops over the next few years. I think uh, that those are very good points. I, I like that. There's another word that we need to keep in there, which is event. Mm. Um, because uh, people like a sense of event. They like a sense of something that's bigger than they are. Mm. So um, finding a way to get that into the community mix, I think, is, is really uh, important. I think social networking is, is really valuable in a couple of ways. Obviously, the marketing way, mm. and it's a, an essential tool for any distributor now to make sure that their film is you know, all over Facebook mm. and Twitter and, and the like. You wanted to talk a bit about uh, producing, you know, what strategies for producers. And so before <laughs> we go today, I think you're right. I mean, we had so much fun. We didn't even get into the sort of finance and distribution side of things. But mm. We talked about, we touched upon anyway. I mean, there's mm. all, there's lots of stuff to talk about in the future. But what should the indie producers do, given some of what we discussed today? Well, I, th I was thinking, I think you need to have a, a clear creative strategy. Um, and I think the way that we are going, everything's available all the time. So not only is the current releases available all the time, the canon and the classics and the everything around the world and all the forms of entertainment are available all the time. I think that, it, and, and, and also given that what really drives social media traffic is what's new and what's distinctive, you know, the, I, I think independent producers have got to think about um, have, have really got to focus on what is cutting edge and what, what, what gets people talking. I think that the idea of, you know, 20 years ago you could have a viable independent B-movie business is sort of gone because, you know, there's there's no room for something which just kind of hits but does not, meets but does not exceed expectations or is kind of predictable or conventional or fits of in sort of, you know, genre you know, genre conventions. I think that to get to get people talking, which is the way, you, which is what you need to break through in terms of marketing. You know, we have such a congested, congested media environment now. You've got to be bold. You've got to be innovative. And th I think the next thing I'd say is that um, I think the mother, I think the mother load is narrative fiction. That's where the real, real money is. But in terms of where the interesting experimentation, in terms of new forms of release, look, documentaries is where it's at right now. Mm. So I think all producers have got to look at making some documentaries, because if only because they're slightly easier to finance, they're definitely cheaper, and you get you get more exposure to kind of to sort of future means of distribution through documentary than through narrative fiction right now. And finally, because actually documentary shooting techniques are going to be what will save your bacon when you're trying to make an ambitious, creatively ambitious feature film for half a million quid. Which is what you're also going to have to do, breaking into trying to break break into the business as a kind of young, uh, you know, new producer. You got making films for less than a million pounds, um, and there's going and that will rule out some subject matter. But there's still plenty you can do for that amount of money, and and what you can do with that amount of money increases year by year. Um, I think I think this is definitely an exciting time to be in documentary, and I have to say that I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know why documentaries suddenly ha became so much higher profile than they have been in the past. But I can say that that one of the things that I find uh, really exhilarating is that you know a couple of years ago I turned off terrestrial television personally because I just got so sick of the advertisements. They were driving me crazy. You know, I didn't want to be interrupted by them. And cable was just as bad because they started introducing ads in between programming, and I was thinking I I'm paying for a cable subscription. I don't want to be watching ads. So. I moved over to a VOD system, and in my case, it was Apple TV. But what's interesting to me is they're they're marketing the documentary side by side with blockbuster movies because mm. it's the same rental to them. They don't care, mm. you know, if one is selling and the other margin's the same. And I think that's a really interesting way of leveling the playing field. I'm fascinated by that because I am now watching more documentaries than ever before because they're suddenly put in front of me. You know, yes. I look at the the screen that says you know new releases, and you know there's Inside Job along with you know. And Avatar they're fabulous. And and, uh, uh, they, there have been waves mm. of documentaries being really popular before, and when they tend to be very popular, also seems to be when there's a dearth of uh, 
fiction offerings. And I know th we're in a supposed golden age of cinema, but um, there's a lot of kind of same wonderfulness about a lot of the films we see, mm. I think. And the documentaries this year have been utterly brilliant, fascinating, inside jobs, a fantastic example. Yeah, and, and it's stop. also stimulating and thought-provoking and well-produced. You know, you see these things yes. in their, their slick entertainment in their own way. Uh, and, and creating conversations and really hitting, you know, hitting the zeitgeist right on. Well, we, 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 we you know, we're, we're a few years past the sort of that terrible end of history era when we thought everyone had all the answers and no more, no more, no more, no more big ideological political issues to be decided anymore, no real problems of our society, everything was fine. We're, a few years past that, times have gotten interesting again. Uh, documentaries have a lot more to say to people, and also I think it also goes with the sort of the. Um, I mean, really, if American television had a decent kind of informative factual output, there wouldn't be the need for you know in America for you know a decent you know decent theatrical documentaries because they'd be getting it on television, but they're not getting that on television. Yeah. And so it's it's it, it also it's also a function of the poverty a lot of the. Sort of Documentary offerings on on television, especially in America. Um, but, I think, I mean, but I think, but I think, I'm not, and I'm not saying everyone should only, only make documentaries. But I think exposure to that type of filmmaking, that type of distribution, that type of community mobilization, mm. are all essential skills you need to be a producer going forward. No, it's a great, it's a great suggestion. I mean, I was thinking too that that you know those skills you pick up, yes, they can be applicable to features. But I think, on top of that, I would add that it's probably good for you know if you're going to make a, a, a low budget feature if then I think it's a great opportunity for for independent producers to work with with their equity ownership to find ways to then strike distribution deals themselves personally try to um, you know the fact that VOD is only 41 million pounds in the UK it you know, sounds small but if you happen to get a good size of that mm -hmm. for a low budget feature that you have distributed directly to iTunes or whomever that is good money, and the fact that you know some of the films uh, released in that environment are making six, nine million dollars is encouraging. That to to independent features, that could be a very lucrative place to to get some recoupment. Mm. So um, you know, managing that process, understanding how to do, do direct distribution, if at all possible, um, you know, mobilizing fans to help you. Uh, with the exhibitions and screenings and whatnot, all of these things sound like an important lesson that you can use down the line. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that independent producers have available to them is, you know, equity, which may not seem like much when you're an independent producer and it's really hard to get anyone to back the thing. But ultimately, if you are able to get it to go and you don't have to rely upon, let's say, a studio buying you out completely to get it onto, onto the, into the cinema or, or where it should be, wherever that may be, you have a chance to reinvest in yourself, which I think is kind of missing from this equation right now. And I think if European independent f filmmakers want to set themselves up and into this as somehow to Hollywood, this would be what it should be, in my opinion, is that they should be finding ways to create teams that have equity in projects that can reinvest back in themselves to grow as a production entity so they can keep making great product. Mm -hmm. And that's only possible if you have some rights ownership. Um, and it's not going to be possible if you have to give it all away. So considering that Hollywood is in a business where they must have almost complete ownership, then this means that we can use this to our advantage and set up a different system where uh, producers and uh, artists and things do have some equity so they can and reinvest themselves and we can see it goes somewhere. But I'm afraid that often the DCMS or any of these sort of reviews and processes that discuss this suggest that less money should be spent, you know, the budget should be lower, people should be more cost and there should be tax rebates and all sorts of suggestions that are very kind of protectionist and sort of seem like stop gaps to me rather than anything else. I mean, there's no part, it seems to me that it's, it's okay to kind of protect your market, to let it nurture and grow, but then get it to stand on its own two feet and then pull out away again so it can keep, you know, keep growing. But mm. uh, if somehow I feel like we put these sort of fuzzy stop gaps in place and that's, it, that's an interim solution in my mind, not a long-term solution. And um, until people can kind of have equity in something that, that grows and is big, which they can reinvest back in themselves, I don't know, I don't know, we think we're going to be living hand to mouth all the time. Mm. Well, I mean, certainly if you, if you have a sort of even quite a small kind of, 
you know fan base if you'd like or community that supports your efforts as a filmmaker that's something that 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 is an equity in itself that you can you can use when you negotiate with a financier or a studio down the line i mean I, I, one of the major issues with all these sort of government reviews on sustainability of the film business is that they the the easy story for politicians to grasp and they're generally time poor people with a lot on their plate and they don't they don't, they don't really have the time to understand fully how an industry works, so like they don't really like quick solutions. An easy solution is we'll put more money into production because it's something that can be understood. But it, but if you but actually if you had a distribution market which worked, i.e., was a level playing field, and you had uh, a, a, a development market that worked, i.e., writers and creative producers with interesting ideas and a real strong sense of craft and energy to what they did. Well, then actually linking the two is just the production money will, will take care of itself. And that's how the independent film business used to be. Mm. Production money was always just a function of discounting the, the value of distribution contracts, you know, discounting that through to development and production. Um, and now, you know, the, when, we, when the international pre-sale markets slumped, then the emphasis became on, you know, directly priming into production without the, without, without the emphasis on on distribution. I mean, I said earlier that producers are making making films for less than half a million pounds. I suppose that is that is that can reduce ambition to some extent. You can make for more than great, yeah, but, the, I, but below that level, though, if you um, you, you, you can you, you can make the money off with with a smaller array of investors, or you can fit within the green light authority of many more people. Or you could do, so, or you could do something which is a hybrid f a television or film production. Or you could do something which is a, you know, a, a, like a, like Summer's Town, where a marketing a marketing budget for Eurostar might pay for it. You know, but that that is the, seems to be the magic, magic number. But I'm worried that we get we get trapped in that. You know, I think we could be much more innovative at that in that price range. But what bothers me is that within Europe, it seems like there's this four to six million euro cap. You know, and then after that, you know, people don't know what to do with it. And you got that huge gap to 120 million for Hollywood, and you know there are films that just the story demands a kind of production value that isn't going to be made okay. for under 10 million dollars. You know, where you know 15 or 20, let's say, instead of I'm not asking for 50, but say yeah. you know 20 million dollars or what. I mean, in in today's money, E.T. was made for 30 million dollars, so that was a pretty yeah. low cost production, but sort of demanded a certain kind of production value, and that's what you'd have to spend today. Probably to make a similar kind of movie. Well, I think I think, I think um, that market. I think that a market is there. It's just that within each territory, there's probably two or three distributors, independent distributors that are nevertheless large companies that need films to scale to compete with the studios, and they will be in the market. In terms of the, for English language films, maybe <coughs> four or five of those per year, and they'll pay several million, you know, dollars or equivalent uh, per film for you know for an advance for each of those films. If you're accessing that market, then yes, you can make you know in in the thirty to forty million dollar range, films of great directors, really interesting talent. It wouldn't be a Tom Cruise movie. Well, actually, it might be if he takes all the profits. But you know, it would be someone. There'll be actors who would be the next Tom Cruise, or you know, who de definitely have heat to them and have a marquee value. That market is quite healthy right now. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a film being produced at the moment, Dread. Which I am global independent sales agent is selling. Um, you know, it, it, when it presented to the market, sold everywhere, at a high level. Uh, and th th there, there are these, the, there are these larger scale independent films that are being made. It's just that there's a, there's a fixed appetite for them, and and also actually they're, you know, they're often as recognisable in terms of, mm. you know, the sort of underlying material as a sort of. The big studio movies. I think when where, where you're trying to market something which is not is not based on the line material or a spin-off or other or an uh, otherwise a recognisable property, you're then left with a, a mixture of you know maybe some <coughs> some pre-sales, some tax incentives, some direct grants, some equity investment, and and just simply by looking at the sort of the relative size of the media markets in each of the territories and each of the major territories, you you settle on that sort of four to six million dollar or sterling range for for those films, um, and I think what you can do for that amount of money has the expect the possibilities have expanded uh, vastly over the last few years. So it's, 
but I, I, I do know what you mean because it's not it's not just about production value it's also about talent and if you want to in this, if you want well, I was thinking you know everyone's going on and on about the King's Speech because of the enormous returns it made but that's a 15 million dollar movie and you know I mean, no disrespect, it looks like a TV movie, you know, a very <laughs> highly, you know, high quality TV movie, yeah. but that's what it is. But it still costs $15 million, and yeah. it's not like it has Tom Cruise in it either, you know, it's got good no. good cast, but not yeah, cast but commanding but his but salary. There was like a production um, value in a sense, which is almost like art actor production value, because you had, mm. you know... Colin Firth, yes, and yeah, Jerry Yeah, you had the world-class actors given <clears> space, <throat> and, you know, and there's, and there's, you know, because I often think about what, what makes cinema, and it's Obviously, it's more than just big bat crowd scene or a enormous special effects. It can also be the sense of luxury that you get when you can luxuriate and mm -hmm. to really fine actors, you know, given space to kind of inhabit roles and develop. And there's, uh, there's almost like a sort of there's almost like a confidence in the filmmaking which says we this that we're engaged in this kind of this grand or this 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 grand undertaking. Which uh, and we're confident about it. That demands your attention. I think sometimes television can be a little bit too mm -hmm. apologetic, can't it? Where they, mm. you know, you've got to cut for the advertising break in ten <laughs> minutes' time. And and mm -hmm. I, I, I was a huge fan of Sopranos mm -hmm. uh, because obviously that's made by a channel that didn't have advertising breaks. And I think it was noticeable in the pacing of the Sopranos and also in the way that the actors, you know, um, when they when they played off each other, they. They had more of that kind of epic quality, and perhaps the, you know, if, they, if you look at the, the the number of gangster movies that had that kind of Godfather since the Godfather, mm -hmm. there's been the sense that you know that they, this, these stories are grander and more epic, and that and that that and that and uh, Sopranos really a TV film, but TV series, but it had cinematic qualities to it, which were. Um, which were often occasioned by the, w w which in part were due to the fact that the, it was pro it was commissioned by HBO, which didn't have advertising breaks and gave space for actors and scenes to breathe. Well, HBO has really, I think, <coughs> been a pioneer for American television, and now there's a lot of interesting product. But I, and what amazes me in a really fun, you know pleasant way is how many of the American TV series that are coming out are you know starring practically unknowns. In subject matter that um, is arcane or kind of mm. niche or, or peculiar or disturbing or whatever it may be, um, and they're, you know, spending pretty good budgets on this stuff. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, why is it so hard to do that in a feature film? You know, why why can't we suggest to you know distributor <laughs> here's a really good story, but we don't have anybody in it that you've that you, you, you've heard of. You might recognize their face from being a supporting character actor or something, yeah. and it's tackling you know. Uh, you know, um, a f you know, people work in a funeral parlor or something. You know, this type of thing, it it doesn't fly. Well, the funding you know? model gives them space to breathe. Mm -hmm. I mean, terrestrial television advertising is sold on an annual basis in the UK, at least, and this in the states as well. That would be interesting. But when when advertising is sold, uh, because we can track through through internet viewing every single view and that everything is customized, as advertising then becomes directly into the program, that will change the culture of television commissioning immeasurably because commissioning editors won't have the space that the funding model gives them right now to kind of to innovate and, and, if, and if you're a subscription channel like HBO that's even better actually it's a, it's a channel it's a channel wide subscription so as long as an editor or a producer within the, within the network has got the backing of his or her bosses then they're going to have that space in which to commission a Sopranos or a, a Mad Men I mean, Mad Men's a perfect example, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Unknown actors, yep. unknown actors, who became instantly in a kind stars. Of arcane thing, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, that sort of that 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 I, th I always think that's where star power's at its greatest when the unknown actor in that film or TV series becomes a star. That's m immeasurably more exciting mm. than having the sort of the existing big name lend there. Well, because the audience, power. I guess, feels like they've made a discovery along yeah. with you, so you know that everyone's in on it. Um, well. It's been a it's been an exciting conversation, and there's a lot more that we could talk about. So we'll have to do it another time. <laughs> Thanks anyway for coming in <laughs> for a you. couple hours and, and chatting about it all. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really Bye. enjoyed it.